Good morning. Welcome to the Sonoma County Master Gardeners Zoom Talks. Um, I'm Nancy Kreveling. I'm your moderator today. Um, I'm a master gardener from the class of 2009, and I've been in Sonoma County since 2018. We also have master gardeners Cleo and Anne helping us today monitor the questions and the chat. Um, this talk is being recorded. And it will be available soon on our uh, Sonoma County Master Gardeners YouTube channel, along with many of our other very interesting presentations. This talk is another in the ongoing collaboration between Sonoma County Master Gardeners and the Sonoma County Regional Library System. Um, for many years, as you probably know, each branch had in-person talks. And then with COVID, we were forced to do um, a more virtual thing, but it's worked out quite well and we're really glad that you're able to join us today. Our talks promote Master Gardener's ethos of sustainability and science-based information. Um, and um, we're so glad that you're here with us today. So um, a few housekeeping things. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, you will not be on camera and you will not be, um, your audio will not be recorded. So you don't have to worry about you personally being recorded. But of course the webinar is be being recorded so that we can present it uh, on our YouTube channel. We hope you have questions and please write them in the Q&A box. Um, that's where we'll be taking the questions from, and our speaker, Bill Klausing, will be answering them after his presentation. Um, and uh, I'll be reading the questions to Bill. Um, if for some reason your Zoom connection drops, just go back to your link, hit it again, and you should be able to get right back in. And we also have some QR codes we're going to provide that have links to our YouTube channel and our web page. And in the chat, we'll be providing information that's supplemental to what um, Bill is going to be discussing with us today. So there will be lots of um, resources for you to check out. And once again, we are recording this presentation. Um, Bill Klausing, our speaker today, has been a gardener, an enthusiastic gardener for decades. He started gardening in the Midwest of the United States um, and in 2008 moved to Sonoma County. And since becoming a master gardener in 2011, he's become a disciple for native planting and habitat gardening. And that's what he's going to share with you today. So thanks very much, Bill, and it's all yours. Thank you, Nancy. Now let's see if we can successfully share my screen here. And I will get going. Good morning, everyone. Share screen. Everything look good, Nancy? Um, looks, looks good. Thanks. So glad to have everybody join. Um, and I hope I can um, impart some knowledge about use, the use of natives in your home garden and reasons why that might be important to all of us in the long run. Uh, I've done this presentation for a number of years uh, in our traditional library in person setting. Uh, this will be my first go round uh, in the Zoom world. And as I was redoing this today, I decided that um, I was going to give the presentation a new name, Native Plants, Habitat Spaces, uh, with an alternative title, Assisting in the Survival of the Planet One Garden at a Time. Uh, and uh, my perspective on that will become more apparent as I move along. Uh, Nancy described how I was born and raised in the Midwest. Um, I was born and raised in Ohio. This is a flashback to my childhood. Well, way before my childhood. Um, the tallest uh, beautiful lady in the back is my late mother uh, as she was attempting to become the peony queen in Van Wert, Ohio, a little town that likes to 
pretend that it is the peony capital of uh, North America. I was born and raised uh, on a traditional sort of Midwestern farm. That's the dairy barn. You can see nice flat land, lots of cornfields. I jokingly refer to where I grew up as Cornfield, Ohio. And then I lived in St. Louis for 27 years. Um, and so that's a photograph that I think that was the last summer um, I moved to Sonoma County in 2008. So I think that might've been the summer of 2007 um, in my backyard in St. Louis. And you can see immediately that that's a different uh, sort of climate than we have here in Sonoma County. But I moved to Sonoma County and I quickly learned uh, about Mediterranean climates. And in a Mediterranean climate, uh, you are uh, dry much of the year, uh, particularly in the summer, uh, uh, with limited moisture during a, a shorter uh, winter season when the weather is cooler and more moist. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, you know, there, are, there is a Mediterranean climate zone on the southwest uh, corner of each of the continents uh, on the planet. Uh, South America, North America, uh, Europe, uh, and uh, Africa. Um, and of course, we live here in California in a Mediterranean climate. I bought a house after I lived here for six months. And you can see that there was uh, some landscaping challenges that I had to undergo. Um, I, I really love the picture on the right uh, where the pampas grass is literally trying to swallow the south side of the garage. Um, and there will be some uh, additional before and after photographs of, of my garden at home along the way. Um, I also am going to, if you have a question that comes up along the way, I'm going to try to stop uh, a, at a couple of points um, and allow Nancy to ask any questions uh, sort of closer to the uh, point of information. So feel free to, when you come up with a question, type it in that box and Nancy will pass that along to me uh, shortly. If you're interested in, in creating habitat space in your home garden, uh, there are really only two things to be absolutely uh, attentive to. You're trying to mimic uh, centuries of plant life in your local watershed. And uh, there really needs to be an absence of pesticides and herbicides. And habitat loss is really the number one threat to all life forms on the planet. Um, and this is becoming increasingly obvious as the years go along. And as we've lost natural habitat space, um, as human development has crawled across the planet, a lot of experts thought for a long time that you could only have an effect on restoring some of that habitat space if you did it in a big fashion. You know, if, if you somehow took half of Iowa and removed uh, the cornfields and returned it to its native natural habitat space. But the thing that we have learned uh, through trial and error and science is that small, small scale possibilities can have a huge effect uh, on uh, the diversity of wildlife in a given area uh, from uh, strips of native plants that are being uh, planted in the middle of large farms uh, to the uh, wildlife corridors that are uh, proposed and have been built in some areas across freeways, that those small things can have a huge effect on the diversity of wildlife in a given area. And many habitat garden supporters will tell you that um, the incorporation of wildflowers might be the most useful tool uh, in a small, small scale garden space like your home garden uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, 
one of which is that it's inexpensive to buy some seed and scatter it in your garden. Uh, and it's one of the easier techniques uh, for the inexperienced gardener. Now, we've lost habitat space for a number of reasons. Uh, we've destroyed huge sections of habitat, building subdivisions and cities. And uh, we have fragmented habitat by uh, building freeways and uh, all sorts of um, unnatural barriers uh, to the movement, the free movement of wildlife. We've also unfortunately uh, brought chemicals uh, and we've planted uh, things from across the world in other people's backyards, which then has, uh, has additional effects. I can't recommend more strongly grabbing this book at the local public library and giving it a read. It's a relatively easy read. For those of you who do not know, um, have not, uh, are not familiar with Doug Tallamy's work, um, Dr. Tallamy is an entomologist. You know, he studies bugs for a living. And he happened to years ago when he, and his family bought their first suburban home. And of course, because he's focused on insects, he quickly realizes that there are plants in his backyard that have a lot of insects, and he has other plants that have no insects. And so this got him into the research of marrying uh, horticulture and gardening, home gardening, uh, with wildlife support. I have a couple of quotes from this first book. I should also mention um, that um, Dr. Tallamy has just recently, last year, per, uh, published a second book. I have to say I've not made it all the way through the second book. It is a little more dense. It's not quite of an easy read as his first book was. But he says in that first book, Gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. And that's sort of a daunting uh, thought that uh, what you do in your home garden could have lasting effects for your children, for your grandchildren, for the generations to come. He also goes on to say that strategically placed and connected patches of restored habitat might foster the survival of some of our wildlife. And um, that is something that concerns me and I suspect many of you. How do we go about trying to create that space in your home garden? And I gave you those early photos of, of the home that I bought here in Santa Rosa. And you could see that it had some challenges. Uh, and if you want to build habitat space, uh, here are the things um, to be paying attention to. Uh, number one is plant selection. Um, I will focus today mostly on true natives. Um, there are also categories of plants that I call near natives. I only say that because they grow very nicely here in Sonoma County climate. Um, dry conditions, so on and so forth. And of course, you can have non-native plants in your garden. Uh, the unfortunate truth is that if you go to the local nursery, most all of the plants there are non-natives. And pollinator support has become clearly much more uh, newsworthy in recent years with the difficulty of bee populations. Of course, I find it, I found it very interesting that um, the public in general didn't become aware of decreasing bee populations uh, until it involved the European honeybee, which of course is not native to North America. Um, and native, 
bees and other pollinators have been suffering from population declines uh, for decades. Um, I'm going to provide uh, later today some resources for the home gardener and try to uh, point out some things so that you can learn more about native plants and what would work well in your home garden. And I'm hoping by the end of my presentation that it might give you a, a new perspective um, for decision making uh, for the home gardener. Um, now, I also, at some point, Cleo, I think, is going to be the one who puts a couple of links um, in for you uh, to grab, one of which is um, those resources for the home gardener. I will go over those on a slide uh, later today. The additional handout that she's going to link is a bloom calendar. And I'm going to talk about that um, in more detail later. Um, the our mantra as Master Gardeners for the University of California is that we are trying to promote sustainable home gardening. Now, the great thing with this topic, with my topic of native plants, is that if you're choosing a native plant, by definition, you are fulfilling all of these requirements for our sustainable home gardening. Uh, if it's a native plant, chances are you're at least close to the right plant in the right place. You're going to conserve water, you're going to protect wildlife, um, and so on and so forth. In your home garden, you have uh, many, many uh, structures, things that exist around your house. You have plants, um, you have hardscapes, you've got driveway, sidewalk, I have a pool in my backyard, um, so I have additional concrete that has to be dealt with. Uh, you know, concrete does not support wildlife. So you try to find ways to work some plantings in um, with those hardscapes. Uh, now, some hardscapes are good. We'll talk about boulders and those sorts of things later. Uh, you've got a lot of insects in your garden. Uh, there's a, a lot of conversation about good bugs and bad bugs. Uh, we even publish as master gardeners lists of good bugs and bad bugs. Um, I am of the mindset personally that there really is no such thing as a bad bug. Uh, although if you're trying to grow vegetables, certainly there are some bugs that will create some issues for you. But all of those insects are part of the diversity of wildlife in your garden, in your habitat space. Uh, those birds need things to eat. Uh, and so I try to be less uh, distinguishing about those bad bugs and continue with the intent that all of those insects are, have a useful purpose in your garden space. We have spiders and birds, you have all sorts of pollinators, flies, dragonflies, mayflies, lots of things. I had lived in my house here in Sonoma County for a couple of years, and I had slowly started to do some uh, landscape changes. And in 2011, I went to Master Gardener School, and I probably took this photograph about that same time that I was in Master Gardener training. When this butterfly appeared, on this uh, echinacea flower in my front garden. And of course, I, I planted echinacea. It was something that I knew from my history of gardening in the Midwest, even though it is not native here to California. Um, it can be a useful pollinator plant. But this was the first time I'd seen this particular beautiful common buckeye butterfly. I thought, oh, wow, where did that come from? I had to figure out who he was, identify the insect, the butterfly. But now what you have to remember is that every butterfly at some point is a caterpillar. And so if you see caterpillars eating leaves in your garden and you destroy the caterpillar, you're never going to get a butterfly. So I just want people to remember that that causes that 
And if you interrupt that cycle, physically, chemically, uh, you are not going to be supporting habitat in your garden. Now, there's a lot of pollinators in your garden and we, we hear a lot about bees. You have butterflies and skippers. You have dragonflies, damselflies, wasps, flies, flies that look like bees, bees that look like flies, um, and birds. All of these things can pollinate plants. The important thing about pollinators is that the pollinators and the insects are the means at which we convert nature's energy, the sunlight, green plants, and the insects are the, the mode for moving that energy up the food chain from insects to birds and reptiles, amphibians, small, mammal, small mammals, and on up the food chain. And so if you don't support the pollinators, you're pulling the pin out of the rest of that wildlife diversity. This is just a, a, a little example that I found uh, um, in a, from uh, a reputable service about bee populations. And of course, the European honeybee has become very uh, commercially important here in the United States. European honeybee was brought in uh, um, by European settlers. They wanted to grow fruit trees. They needed bees. European honeybees will live in a hive. You can have a colony. It's transportable. It's commercially sellable. So they've become a pertinent part of agriculture in the United States. But the native bees that we have here in California and elsewhere around the country are 200 times more efficient at pollinating than a honeybee. Um, honeybee uh, hives, uh, uh, boxes, uh, typically contain 75,000 bees, 100,000 bees. And it would take that many bees to pollinate an acre of uh, apple trees here in Sonoma County. But that same acre of apple trees could be pollinated by 500 mason bees. So you can see the difference in efficiency between native bees and honeybees. So we wanna to try to encourage uh, um, the development and the population of native bees. Now I include this picture, a non-native uh, purple cone flower, just so that you can get a really good uh, view of uh, this European honeybee collecting pollen you can see pollen on his legs sticking out from the beside his body. And you can see the pockets of pollen uh, very obviously in, in the flower, in the bloom of this uh, cone flower. Now, of course, the European honeybee is going to take this pollen back to the hive to make honey. Native bees are going to be collecting this pollen to stuff their layers for their eggs to live on, for the larvae to live on when they're born in the next um, life cycle. How do we encourage to have uh, a good population of pollinators in your garden? Um, you see in the, 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 the second check mark on this slide, no mulch madness. Um, many, very many, in fact, um, I think the number is the majority of our native bees here in Sonoma County are ground dwellers. And so if you have a huge layer of mulch between air and the soil, um, you will discourage nesting. Um, now, of course, in the midst of a drought, with everybody telling you to mulch everything heavily to preserve moisture, you're sort of in a conundrum. Uh, I try to take areas of my garden and much of my garden is mulched, but there are sections that are not. And in areas that are not, I try to use a thick layer of compost as opposed to um, wood chips 
which is more friendly for native bee nesting. To help populate pollinators, you need to provide food, water, and shelter year round, not just in the spring, not just in the summer, but you need to keep an eye, uh, keep a, 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 a focus in the back of your mind about what you can do for um, providing food, water, and shelter year round. And I include a point here about sound culture, using sound cultural practices. And that just means that if you do some things right in your garden, you will prevent uh, um, some of the other issues that might come down the road. Uh, um, and I'll talk about that some more as we go along. For shelter in your garden, um, for pollinators, well, really for other things, amphibians, uh, uh, reptiles, there are lots of things that you can put in your garden that the very sort of um, buttoned up neat gardener that I used to be in my mind has a little trouble not picking up every leaf that's out of place in the garden. Um, but all of these things that I've listed here will help provide shelter uh, for wildlife in your garden. The use of bunch grasses. Um, there, are native, there are certainly native bunch grasses um, that you can use. The placement of logs, old logs, stumps, snags, things that are left uh, that are wood-based that are in your garden uh, are great for native bees. Uh, the use of some rocks, boulders, that, that's, that's a shelter, that's a hiding mechanism. Uh, when you select plants in your garden, uh, every species is going to be either evergreen or deciduous. There are, there are some in-betweens, some semi-deciduous. And there's nothing wrong with either of these things, but I think you want to consider having a combination. Um, evergreen plants will provide additional shelter in the winter months. Um, deciduous plants will lose their leaves and that leaf litter becomes an important part of habitat space. I include the point of proper maintenance in here. Uh, I do typically always have the urge to try to clean things up in the garden, uh, but I do make particular, uh, a particular point in the winter time that I wait to do that spring cleanup until spring is almost upon you. Um, in that leaf litter around plants at the base of plants where you know leaves collect from the wind uh, in the winter time, those are breeding grounds for insects, for bees, for other pollinators. Um, so I try to give them a, a wait until springtime to clean up some of that stuff to try to give them the best chance of survival. Bill, I, do, there Bill, is, I do see that there's a question. Um, yeah. um, the question is, I'm all for pollinators, but wasps have presented a problem with trying to get into my home. They're coming through the kitchen fan vent, upstairs bath vent, and the fireplace. When I had a pool, they took over my pool. What are your suggestions for dealing with wasps? Oh, now, I don't have any particular special wasp. Um, I think I would ask you to refer you to um, a pest control company, quite frankly. Um, I don't have, I have all of those things that you describe and I don't have any trouble with wasps. I don't know if that's a specific uh, species of wasp that you're having trouble with. Uh, I think that would probably be the first thing that you're gonna have to identify is exactly what wasp that is and why you have an extra large population of them. Yeah, um, I, I know one thing, um, if it's a ground nest, 
of wasps. You can call vector control and they will come remove the nest. Um, so that, that is an option here in Sonoma County. If it's not a ground nest uh, wasp, then, then they won't come help. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just really uncertain of that. Uh, the, the description from the question, it, it sounds to me like a specific infestation of a particular wasp that they're having trouble with. So um, I, 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 maybe if they have an additional question, they can ask again and, and we'll give them some better guidance later. We can put the um, UCIPM link to wasp um, wasp information in the. In I, the I I entered that uh, UCIPM wasp management in the answer to anonymous. Great, thank okay. you. Terrific, thank you, Cleo. Thanks. Um. So, the earlier slide I talked about food, shelter, and water, and I just the previous slide talked about shelter. Everything in your garden, all lives need water. We're certainly very, very aware of that here in the year 2021 um, about what the lack of water is. Um, but for pollinators particularly, you need to create some sort of a regular water source. Um, I have a couple of bird baths um, in my garden. Um, you'll see from this particular photograph, the water looks a little murky and there's wine corks floating in there. Um, I, I only add this, uh, uh, an entomologist from UC Davis at an education seminar that I went to, one of their points was insects really don't want sterile bottled water. They want water that has nutrients in, minerals. They need those for survival. Um, so the entomologist recommended that you leave a little leaf litter, decomposing leaf litter in the bottom of a bird bath, um, which will, uh, can provide additional nutrient source for pollinators. And the wine corks, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, my house, my current home has a pool. And in the early years when I lived here, uh, I had so many pollinators um, die by suicide in the water in the pool. Like every time that you got in the pool, you were literally clearing bees off of the water. That same entomologist recommended floating corks in a bird bath. And the second that I added corks to my bird bath, I have not had a dead bee in the pool since. People will sell you commercial bee houses, insect houses, insect hotels. Those can be useful. Um, this one, actually, this was bought at a master gardener function. Uh, I've had more uh, action in this mason bee house than this commercial thing that's under the eaves on the south side of my house, which has had no use um, from native bees. But the point that I just really wish to make is that all of these things in your garden, whether they are alive or they're not alive, they are all contributing factors with the survival of species. And now I'm going to get into um, a little bit more about plant selection, um, native plant selection particularly. I think I'm hoping that Cleo by now has added uh, the link to the handout that um, is the Bloom calendar, um, which I created. Uh, I finished it last year during my pandemic isolation. And um, the plants that are on that calendar are sp specific plants that are native here to Sonoma County. Um, none of the plants on that list um, are, are plants from elsewhere in California, so to speak. Um, as you know, here in Sonoma County, 
we have a lot of uh, microclimates, it's a very popular word, um, but you know, we have the climate in Bodega Bay is significantly different than the climate in Forestville, which is different than the climate in Healdsburg or in the Alexander Valley or in the Sonoma Valley. Um, so I just like people to be aware of the different attributes of native plants and the fact that there are many different types of native plants here in Sonoma County. We see a lot of ne what I call near natives, um, the lavenders and the rosemary, things that are uh, that grow very well and do very well here in Sonoma County with low water. Um, and many of them can be pollinator supportive uh, plants. Um, but one of the things that you will discover if you have enough uh, uh, bloom coverage in your garden is that if you look carefully at your, um, for example, lavender, you will find almost exclusively European honeybees on the lavender and not any of the native California bees. And you know, the original title for my talk uh, when it was developed was a mostly native habitat garden because my uh, perspective is that you can certainly use some selective non-natives, um, but select ones that have a, a habitat purpose. Um, do they provide shelter or food um, or other things? Uh, that the wildlife in your garden might need. Uh, true native plants um, are the ones that are best suited to your local soils. They've had um, centuries, millennia to adapt to climate conditions. Uh, we know um, from science and history that uh, California has always suffered from long periods of drier versus less dry uh, years for the centuries, but those true native plants are the ones that are going to be attractive to the native bees, birds, and butterflies that will exist in your garden because they've had centuries uh, to evolve together. Now, um, habitat planting strategies, uh, I've got a few things to think about here. Um, you're going to want to have some level of density of food sources in your garden space. Um, you know, four selected plants on the far corners of your garden are not going to provide habitat support. Um, you, you, you want to have things planted close enough together so that pollinators can move easily from one section of your garden to another. Uh, you will want blooms uh, ideally for all seasons. Uh, in a perfect habitat space, you would have something blooming 365 days a year. Now, of course, that becomes a, a challenge, uh, particularly in the winter months. Um, but that is the point of the creation of that bloom calendar. Um, and we get started with that in a minute. We'll be going through individual species of plants um, from my garden that sort of follow the calendar year. You want a wide variety of bloom size and style. Um, but you want each plant to have a purpose. Does it provide food? Does it provide shelter? Uh, you also want to, uh, frequently uh, people get really focused on pollinators. So you, you, there's a lot of discussion about perennials, low growing things. But I also need people to think about, you know, your, your habitat space has three dimensions. I mean, it doesn't exist in the just the three feet closest to the ground. It exists up in the air as well. And so you want some taller shrubs, uh, you want some trees. And of course, size of tree is an additional issue, particularly in suburban gardens, urban gardens, 
um, where you're limited with space. There's a couple of slides here, uh, which just goes to show the, the, the um, variety of bloom size and style that I talked about there. This is a native plant, uh, Scrofularia californica, bee plant. It's relatively nondescript, um, but that little bloom is the size of a hat pin. And so you realize that you're going to attract, be attracting a whole different population of pollinators in that plant, in that bloom, because it's so tiny. Uh, you know, a big bumblebee is never going to be able to get in there to get at the pollen, so to speak. And then you also have a variety of bloom um, shapes. This is a non-native salvia that I have in a container in my garden. Um, but that open, that big open blue bloom just gives you, you know, it's practically shouting at a pollinator to climb on in see what's in here for you. And this is the point at which I'm gonna start going through um, this, the bloom calendar uh, handout that I have with a lot of examples of native plants uh, or mostly native plants. And I think I'll stop and get a couple more questions here before I get on this next little roll. What do you got for me, Nancy? Okay, well, there's a couple that relate to bird baths. So one says, I like to keep, I, I read to keep the water in my bird bath clean. You suggest nutrient rich water. How can I keep both happy birds and insects? Well, um, uh, uh, um, moderation in all things, I would say. Yes, you don't want that bird bath to get particularly too dirty. And so, you know, that bird bath that I showed a, a visual of in my garden gets cleaned out five or six times a year and fresh water gets put in. So that water never gets particularly, um, uh, you know, you certainly don't want the water to get funky. Okay. It, oh, I'm sorry. And then this leads, I think, to the next one, which is how do you deal with mosquitoes in bird baths? Well, I, and that is an additional problem. Um, the mosquitoes will stay out of your bird bath if you find a way to keep the water moving. Um, the, the, the beauty now is that you can get little solar powered uh, water pumps. All you have to do is get that water to move a little bit and um, you can keep mosquitoes out. Um, the, the mosquito larvae need still water. So if you, if you just find a way to move water, if mosquitoes are a problem, you can take care of that problem. You can, you can solve that issue. Great. Okay. Um... There's another one that says lantana is a non-native, but it seems to be quite popular with bees. Is this a reasonable choice? I, I, lantana certainly does it, attract a fair number of bees. And, um, and I've seen it used quite a bit here in Sonoma County as a landscape plant. Um, I did try to plant some lantana here at my house when I first moved in um, with no particular intention other than the fact that I I grew lantana in the Midwest in my garden, only there it was an annual because it froze every winter. Well, it froze here in my garden in Santa Rosa as well. So it did not stay long-term. But, but those non-natives, uh, selected non-natives can certainly be pollinator supporters. The, the, the bigger point, um, I guess, um, that I wanna make sure that, uh, that I get across is uh, with many of the native plants, it is less about the bloom per se than it is about the plant. Um, you'll, you'll see a slide later on of, mono, of um, milkweed, native milkweed, um, you know, which helps support monarch butterfly populations. Uh, it's not the bloom on the milkweed that is significant. Adult monarch butterflies can feed on a plethora of blooms in your garden, but the monarch female butterfly will only lay the eggs on the milkweed. And that tidbit exists for almost all native insects, butterflies, bees here in Sonoma County. They are looking 
for specific native plants to lay their eggs, which feed their larvae, which then survive, you know, gives the next generation a chance at survival. So it, it the, the lantana in the question works as a pollinator plant for adults, but it doesn't provide a substrate for next gen for future generations. If right. I answered that well enough. I think that gives us a lot more insight. Thank you. Okay. So um, now I'm going to be moving through this, uh, and I'm going to try to move fairly quickly through this bloom calendar. Um, and I should just point out, most of these photographs are taken in my garden. Um, there's a couple that I've photographed elsewhere uh, and added those slides, but uh, they are all my photographs, so to speak. Um, this particular, you know, you have a non-native non leptospermum, um, which I love in my garden because it starts blooming just after Christmas. And so it feeds the European honeybees in the neighborhood through the springtime when there are not a lot of other things in bloom. And you can see the orange California poppies in the background. But that same hillside later in the summer looks like this. Non-native Tucurium, non-native Plumbago, and then you see the red um, California fuchsia Epilobium, which we'll have a separate slide later. But again, so that same hillside, you've seen two photographs, one of which was in March, this is in August. And you can use, utilize the same space over the calendar year um, to provide food for wildlife. So we're starting now at the beginning of the year, January. What blooms in January? Well, one of the first things that blooms in the winter are our local um, manzanitas. Here's a Dr. Hurd and a Howard McMinn in my front yard. This, that slide was several years ago. That slide was this week. I just took some updated photographs. Now, the important thing, uh, one of the important things with manzanitas is that, of course, they are, uh, are indeed low water. That's an adult Howard McMinn that I took in somebody else's garden that really shows its beauty in full bloom and after it gets uh, to sort of uh, mature size. But you have these blooms in the wintertime January, February, March. So it does feed early pollinators. It will be the, the uh, manzanitas will be the first time that you see a native bumblebee in the, in the wintertime at the end of winter. And you get the lovely peeling bark. You get the little umbrals of flowers. Hummingbirds will feed on those. But then you get um, the little fruit, which will feed bird populations and other creatures in your garden. Uh, as time moves on. I just took that picture, that's Dr. Hurd fruit um, on the right in my garden this week. Um, so it is nearly ripe. And of course you can see why the, the name Manzanita little apple uh, exists in general. Uh, I took these, these photos a few years ago for one of my library talks. And it wasn't until I, I was, really was interested in just getting the, the photograph of the, that early bloom in the center you notice on the underside of one of the leaves, egg sacs from an insect. I didn't even notice that I had accidentally um, gathered that. But that's the point of, of having these native plants in your garden, is that the native insects know to use them um, as a nursery for their youngsters. Ribes, um, also a late winter bloomer. Um, Ribes sanguineum is a red flower current. Um, it's very red in its original form. This um, glutinosum varietal is very popular. You'll see it in a lot of nurse in the nursery trade with those beautiful pink flowers. But again, um, this week in the garden, the fruit is setting and developing and maturing, which will feed birds, et cetera, et cetera, um, in the garden. Ceanothus, California lilac. Uh, the Ceanothus genus tends to be, tends to do better coastal. This particular huge Ceanothus was at the um, UC Davis uh, haagen Honeybee Garden. Um, and there's a, here's, here are two 
um, Ceanothus from my front yard, both of which are now dead. Um, Dark Star, when I had the two days of 116 degrees two years ago, gone, fried. And um, the Thersiflorus um, died a similar sort of uh, death um, when I had a couple of days of 114 degrees. Um, oh, that was that was a couple of weeks before the Tubbs fire when, when, when uh, literally the plant went from alive to dead uh, overnight. But full sun, elevated hillside, very low water, almost no water in the summer. And that 116 degrees was just too much for them. Because I said, they really like to be coastal in general. Although there is a, there's a white um, Ceanothus with a white bloom that um, grows more inland uh, and does better in the heat. Uh, we have a Western Columbine that's native here to uh, Sonoma County. Uh, you have Seaside Daisy. I have not had good luck with them in my garden, I think primarily because I'm too hot uh, in the summertime and I need to put them someplace where they get a little more protection from the afternoon sun. Uh, on the coast, you know, you'll find a Ridgeron all over the coastal bluffs uh, on the west side of Sonoma County. We have the Western Redbud, a small tree, which is ornamental. I have a smaller non-thriving one in my garden, unfortunately. Uh, and people use this as a small tree example, but you can see that it doesn't necessarily always stay particularly small. This is in the JC neighborhood here in Santa Rosa. And um, we think that this um, Western Redbud in the in the JC neighborhood is the champion Western redbud, the largest of its species currently alive. Um, we have a native uh, Pacific Coast iris, um, Iris de Glossiana, which comes in a variety of colors. Uh, this is a clump that I have in my garden. I added a couple more um, this spring. Hopefully they will make it through the summertime. Uh, also in the springtime bloom calendar section um, are all of our native uh, oak trees. Uh, this is partic this particularly is the coast live oak. Um, you know, we've got the valley oak and the blue oak, um, the Engelman oak. We have several uh, native oak trees, all of which do bloom in the springtime. They of course have fruit, acorns in the fall um, and one of the things that I that I ask people to think about uh, if they they're interested in getting more pollinators and insects in their garden, they'll go out and they'll buy an insect hotel at a commercial store when Mother Nature's insect hotel is right in front of you now. Uh, I like for people to think of trees as insect hotels. Uh, I've got some California wildflowers all sort of clumped together. Nemophila, baby blue eyes, five spot. You can see they are absolutely lovely. Um, meadow foam, Linanthes. Clarkias, this is Unguiculata. That's a patch of Unguiculata a few years ago in my garden. Rubicunda, Clarkia rubicunda. I did not have great luck with this self-seeding. The beauty of wildflowers is that they, if you get them planted in the right location and you give them the right sort of conditions, they will self-seed and re-propagate um, every springtime. Uh, this is one of my favorites, uh, Clarkia amoena. If we had a normal water year, I would still have some of these blooms still in my garden here in early July. Um, needless to say, they did not have a very good uh, year with the lack of rainfall since the month of March. Um, they unfortunately suffered from, uh, from drought through the springtime in my garden. And this same little patch, looking along the side of my driveway, you can see when I scattered wildflower seeds a few years ago. Don't be daunted with the fact, with the idea of planting wildflower seeds. I simply take the wildflower seed, mix it with a little compost as a carrier so that you can try to scatter it more evenly, the wildflower seed. 
and then cover it with some um, mulch. I did that in the month of December. This was at Christmas time and you can see the wildflower seeds coming up once you had some rain, rainfall. Now the wood thing that, I, the thing that I would suggest, here's Phacelia. Um, I've not had a lot of good luck with that. Other people have locally with Phacelia species um, is to try to separate. Um, we have these, these low growing wildflowers, which I made the mistake of adding some poppies nearby and the California poppies literally just drown them out um, because this is very small vegetation. So I would just recommend that you try to uh, group wildflowers by the vegetation size and sort of try to keep the California poppies in their own sort of corner um, because once you have poppies in your garden, you will always have poppies in your garden. Um, here we're really sort of almost moving out of wildflowers because these are perennial. It's a perennial um, silver bush lupin and um, blue eye grass, Cicerinchium bellum, um, but both of which are lovely in the springtime. Here you can see a little combo uh, photograph of um, my uh, perennial lupin, small shrub, um, with, with poppies blooming in the springtime. It's a great little purple and orange combination. Um, Medea elegans, tarweed, very adorable little um, yellow flower. I know you can get these. Um, I've seen them, I think I've seen them at Cal Flora Nursery as well. I know Annie sells them. Um, they will act as a wildflower because they will seed, not prolifically, but I've gotten them to sustain in my garden. Um, tarweed is interesting because it's a night bloomer. So it'll be blooming when you get up in the morning, but when that sun comes across the house and hits it, the blooms close. But you can see this at the at late in the summer. This is, would be in, a, in the month of August in my garden, a non-native aster. There are native asters that you can use and that Medea uh, in the background, the tarweed. Hookahs, there are two native hookahs to California, Maxima in the Southern part of the state, Micrantha in the Northern part of the state. Um, and you can see that the vegetation is green as opposed to the um, fancy hookahs that you will find at uh, your local nursery with colored leaves, red leaves, bronze colored leaves, um, and those uh, cultivars, those uh, nursery developed uh, pretty alternatives, you might get some uh, habitat benefit from those. But my suggestion is, is that if you can, if you can go to a native plant nursery and get the original, uh, you will be best served doing that. Flannel bush, Fremontodendron, it's a large shrub. Um, I'm trying to treat mine and get mine to grow more like a tree. Uh, if you leave a flannel bush to its own devices, it will be wider than it is tall. I'm trying to constrain my, the width on mine and make it more upright growing. Beautiful yellow flowers in the springtime. You, they do have a fuzzy leaf. You wouldn't want to put this next to a, um, a sidewalk that is heavily trafficked. Salvias, great pollinator plants, um, habitat support. Um, the, the macrophylla and microphylla salvias are not native to California. You can see this hot lips in my garden, but you know, my native carpenter bees love the, love the hot lips as do my hummingbirds. Um, Salvia spathaceae, um, a native likes a little shade. Uh, mine is less happy when it has too much sun. Native Salvia mellifera. I really love this one. It puts on a great show early in the springtime. Uh, it's not so happy now this summer in this dry summer. Um, and uh, Salvia clevelandii is native to the southern part of the state. Uh, not particularly here in Sonoma County. California buckeye, 
which is ubiquitous here. And I know we might immediately get a question about the honeybees, European honeybees um, do find issue with the pollen on a, the bloom of a California buckeye. Um, I would just assure, assure people that there's plenty of um, information to support that if you have other uh, pollinator friendly plants uh, in your garden, the European honeybees will leave these blooms alone. But this is such a ubiquitous, I love this. I'm from Ohio, you know, the Buckeye State. And I happen to be with a couple of my siblings in San Francisco, and this is in Union Square. And there's literally a plaque for California Buckeye um, at one of the entrances. I think that's the north west entrance to Union Square. Um, but you know, that was sort of fun with three siblings from Ohio with that California Buckeye sign. I added this gum plant. This is um, Grindelia stricta, which is very coastal by nature. Um, there's another Grindelia that's on that uh, uh, bloom calendar, which is an upright Grindelia. Um, this is interesting. This native plant, the uh, it's commonly called gum plant because th th this is what this is the sap uh, in these plants is what native peoples used as adhesives for adhesives. Sambucus nigra, native here to Sonoma County. It again, it's a plant that that does. Um, you know, sort of the, the, the perfect trifecta of, of, of uh, habitat shelter and it blooms in the spring for pollinators and it has fruit in the fall. I happen to have uh, one of these uh, us, us, uh, fancy Sambucus nigra black lace in my garden and you can see how that vegetation looks different, um, but very striking in the springtime with those white blooms. And then you can see a photograph I took this week um, of uh, fruit setting on that, sam on that same Sambucus. Uh, that fruit will turn um, jet black and shiny when it is ripe. Calicanthus occidentalis, spice bush, physocarpus, nine bark. Um, these are both shrubs, native shrubs here in Sonoma County. Now, the one thing that I do wanna say, and I would refer people um, to go to um, another, uh, to go to a plant, native plant source, or even to our Master Gardener website, um, if you are specifically interested in plants that are all very, very low water. These are not two examples of that. These two plants really like to exist in the undergrowth um, near waterways in riparian sort of settings. Um, so they require a little more water to do well in your garden. Toyon, heteromeles, arbutifolia, Christmas berry, spring bloom, winter berry, fruit, cedar wax wings, mockingbirds. Um, you'll find all sorts of birds feeding on uh, the fruit of Toyon in the wintertime. Epilobium. Uh, it's one of my favorites. It's one of the easiest to grow here in Sonoma County, although I've learned in my garden there are places it does better than others. And unfortunately, that's just a trial and error uh, uh, experiment. Um, this is a patch that sits underneath my kitchen window. And I literally can sit at my kitchen window and watch hummingbirds feed um, daily. And uh, the photo on the left is from previous years. The photo on the right, I just took this week, the afternoon sun was just hitting those red blooms that really caught my attention. Um, but very beautiful. This patch does very well. Um, it gets morning shade, but afternoon sun. Um, and it's also next to the house. It's low growing. So, you know, it, it adds to that sort of uh, fire aware resiliency that you don't want large shrubs next to your home. Next little section, areogonums, California buckwheats, which have become very popular. I've become very enthused on them. This is areogonum nudum. 
This is a version of Newtom, Ellen Nelson's yellow, which came from Northern California, which has a yellow bloom rather than the white pink. This is Ariaganum grande, uh, which is actually only specifically native to the Santa Cruz Islands off the coast of California. Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, Catalina, those islands. Um, but all of these Ariaganums um, are great pollinator plants, bees, butterflies, um, and there are a number of butterflies that um, actually do lay their um, eggs in, in uh, the vegetation, which is relatively unremarkable, low growing, gray green vegetation in general. Um, Ariaganum giganteum, St. Catherine's lace, which is also from the southern part of the state. Uh, fasciculatum is here, native here to Sonoma County. Uh, this particular one, Warren, Warrener Lytle, which I just took a photograph, is just coming into bloom this week in my garden. Um, and this particular Warren, Warrener Lytle, that is not easy to say, is a ground cover uh, version of fasciculatum. Uh, typically, fasciculatum is taller, three or four feet tall. Um, this Warner Lytle stays about uh, 12 inches off the ground. The next slide is going to show you this years later, this um, St. Catherine's Lace in full bloom this summer in my garden. Um, I was just looking at that yesterday. It was completely covered in pollinators in the afternoon. Ariaganum latifolium, it's the latest blooming of the native uh, Ariaganums. Uh, I'm really entertained by this photograph. I took this photograph accidentally when I first arrived in Sonoma County um, in the first year when I was at the coast. And, the, and I just happened to like the combination of those two things together. As it turns out, they're important. Uh, the Dudleya farinosa is the Dudleya that, you know, has been poached and sold on the black market up and down the coast of California. Um, you know, so these are two very important coastal plants. Uh, when you're in Bodega Bay and you look north from the parking lot and you see that expanse of sort of burnished bronze on the hillside later in the summer, uh, much of that is uh, the blooming Ariaganum on that hillside. Sulfur buckwheat, Ariaganum umbilatum, um, does very well here in Sonoma County, not native to Sonoma County, uh, but I've included it here. Um, it's available and it's also a great pollinator plant. Um, we have yarrow, which is native here to Sonoma County. I particularly like the, the, the red version, but I have not had uh, good sustainability with that version in my garden. Here's my finally my first successful um, native milkweed in the garden. Um, unfortunately, when it bloomed, I was on vacation this year, so the blooms have already spent. Um, but I think now this is three years old, so I think it's going to survive long term. Once you get it established, it will be there forever. Uh, Monardella villosa, coyote mint. Um, this is the same little clump in two different photographs, sh early morning shade versus late afternoon um, sun. Wyethia. Mimulus, and they've changed that. Uh, it's no longer Mimulus now, it's Diplacus. Um, I'm old fashioned, I stick to the original genus Mimulus, um, which is a great little flower, blooms in the springtime. Uh, if you don't like those colors, you could choose those colors. Uh, the orange is creamsicle and the white is alba. Um, and uh, I talked about the significance of providing shelter with bunch grasses. Here is a clump of uh, native Muhlenbergia ragans. And uh, that was early in its life. That was approximately five years later, that same clump. You know, so this is, this is, gets to be a large uh, uh, bunch grass when it gets to be an adult. In, we're moving to the end of the bloom calendar year here for native plants. Um, we've got um, Western goldenrod. I just took this in my garden. Um, it is just thinking about opening. I did see pollinators on it yesterday for the first time. 
it will bloom July and August. Uh, this is really what people frequently describe as the last of the blooming plants in Sonoma County for the summertime, which will bloom in September, October. Coyote brush, Baccharis pilularis. Um, the adult is a fairly sizable shrub. Um, it, there are a couple of, um, one is Twin Pink, Twin Peaks, and I think the other one is Pigeon Point maybe, um, that are um, sort of lower growing, bigger than a ground cover, but certainly lower growing versions of Baccharis. You know, in the blooms, uh, coyote brush comes in both a male and a female. Um, the male blooms are really very boring. Um, the females are, are a little more exciting. Uh, but the point of this in my garden is not as much for the blooms as um, the vegetation is, uh, is food for multiple species of butterflies um, here in Sonoma County. And again, so we're back to that whole concept of the plant is frequently as important as the bloom uh, when you're selecting. And I've talked about the, the, the selected use of non-natives in your garden. And this is one example that I like to use. Um, we're very familiar with the traditional um, lavender, Provence, I believe is the varietal um, that people uh, frequently have in their garden here in Sonoma County. This is a, a, a varietal called Goodwin Creek Gray. And it blooms, repeat blooms. If you cut it back, it reblooms. Uh, and unlike other lavenders, if you cut it back hard, it will regrow from the hard wood at the base of the plant, I have learned. And I took this photograph in November of 2015, and you can see it is still blooming. And this lavender literally blooms all winter long until you cut it back. Unfortunately, when you cut it back, it looks really raggedy for a few weeks uh, until the new growth sets in. Um, but it will feed those few random bees that are out there um, in the winter months in my garden. There is a native hawthorn, um, which is difficult to find in the nursery trade here in California. I have this in my garden, Paul Scarlet. It's very uh, available in the nursery trade. Uh, but again, it's beautiful in the springtime. It's good for pollinators in the springtime. And it makes a fruit, which in the winter, again, feeds um, winter birds that are in your range in the wintertime, particularly um, Cedar wax wings and mockingbirds um, feed on the fruit on this in my front yard. These are two non-natives in my garden. They are not in bloom yet. They'll bloom in August and in September. Um, uh, Rudbeckia and a non-native aster, um, which I use simply because they extend that bloom season. I included this photograph just because I enjoyed taking it this week. This was my 4th of July fireworks for photograph that did not endanger um, any wildlife, nor did it scare any pets. Now, I do want to, um, I'm going to be wrapping up here shortly, and then we'll take some more questions. But I want to make sure that, you know, patience is, is <laughs> goodness knows it's a virtue. I could learn a better. Um, but particularly when you're dealing with natives in this Mediterranean climate that we live in, many of them grow very slowly. Uh, you know, don't, pl don't plan on planting a manzanita and having it be 10 feet tall in three years, like you could with some other nursery plants. Um, the natives uh, can develop slowly. And of course, we have the whole concept of no rain in the summertime, which helps things um, grow more slowly as well. But uh, after five years, um, I really noticed an increase in, in um, native species and the diversity of species in my garden. Um, Brant's corollary, uh, I've, this is so, sort of my own uh, creation, as it were. Um, I have a coworker who moved to Santa Rosa and filled his property with vegetables and fruit trees. I did the opposite. I filled my garden with native plants 
before I started growing food products. And um, Darren would come to work and every day it would be, I've got such and such a bug on my, you know, on my asparagus. I got something on my strawberries. I got something on my blueberries and it's something on my tomatoes. You know, there was always a pest that was creating problems with his food gardening, but I'd been to his garden. There were no native plants. There were really almost no pollinator plants available. And my perspective on that is, if you start with the right mix of plants and you get the right balance of bugs, insects, critters, so to speak, in your garden, it will diminish problems that you encounter growing vegetables. Um, I do not have trouble with anything attacking my tomatoes or my zucchini or my cucumbers or my peppers or any of the other things that I hear other people complain about uh, pests in their vegetable garden, um, I simply haven't had experience of. Maybe some of that is luck, but I think a lot of that is having enough other creatures that will come and eat those caterpillars off of your tomato plants. And I'm hoping that, you know, that my presentation here today will give you a, a sort of a new paradigm for selecting your plants. I don't want to restrict your choices, but I just want to encourage you to form better de de decisions in selecting what you plant in the garden um, and make decisions that will benefit all habitat residents. Uh, I made this little mental checklist um, when you're out shopping, uh, these five things. Is the species truly native? Does it fit a drought tolerant community? Is it evergreen or deciduous? When on the calendar does it flower? And does it produce any additional food for your habitat space? And I just, you know, these are creatures that did not live on my property when I moved here in 2008. And now, you know, they're, they're regular visitors. A tohi and a junko like doing battle on my patio earlier this week. Um, but it, it's noticeable if you're if you're patient and you plant the right things, um, these critters will come to your garden. I mean, they're there, they're out there. We just wanna support them and provide them with food and shelter and water. And here's a little before and after. You saw that photograph on the left early in my presentation. And uh, there's the one on the left, five years later. So 2008 and 2013, well, it's a beautiful garden space. There's not one stinking native plant in there because I planted that in 2009 uh, before I got on the native plant train. So now that bed is getting reworked with lower growing, it's next to the house, low growing native natives. Uh, sort of an overview. This is what I inherited when I bought my house in uh, my current home in uh, 2008. You can see there's, there's three giant eucalyptus on the left, two giant eucalyptus on the right. Eventually those went away. That was when the, two, the three on the left went away. And then eventually the two on the right went away. That was, I think, spring of 2019, um, a curb shot um, of my garden in the front. And this is how you know that you've gone too far. If he shows up in your garden, you have too many natives. Here's the resources um, that I wanted to um, share with people. And um, they are on that uh, link that Cleo hopefully has put in. Um, and the, the link is in there. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Nancy. And then um, wh where can I go buy, where can I go see native plants? Um, I am amazed at even um, fairly avid gardeners who simply do not know that we have a native plant nursery here in Sonoma County, Cal Flora Nursery, um, which um, is a great resource locally here. Um, there is an additional, there's a small native plant nursery, mostly natives. Um, in Point Ray Station, a much smaller collection of plants. 
Um, Annie's Annuals now has an entire native section in the back of uh, their nursery in Richmond. Um, I've still not been to the Bay Natives um, location in San Francisco. It's on my list of things to do. And then um, Larner Seeds is a great wildflower seed source. And um, they are also local here in Northern California. And um, it's inexpensive to buy wild, wildflower seeds. And so I would encourage people to do that. And thank you for supporting UC Master Gardeners, Sonoma County. And I see we have some more questions out there for me. Yeah, we have lots of questions. <laughs> okay. So, so there are several that are related. So I'm not gonna go in order that they were received. I'm gonna kind of try to group them by topic. So in talking about the, um, the bunch grasses, one person wants to know, do you have to cut them back regularly? Um, and then another one says, do you cut your deer grass back in the winter? Um, I cut my deer grass back in the springtime at the end of winter. Um, one of the interesting things that I learned um, this year when I, um, cut back my bunch grass, my deer grass, is that I discovered that that was the place that my um, Western fence lizards were all hiding and breeding and replicating when I cut that grass back in probably February. Um, they're, all grasses would be okay if you didn't cut them back, clearly. Uh, they would exist in nature without anybody cutting them back. Um, from an aesthetic, perspective, I like to cut back, cut bunch grasses back um, in the springtime, before springtime. You really want to do it before the spring growth really gets going, but I want to wait until after that winter repopulation shelter thing is finished. Yeah, we also have a lot of lizards and occasional gopher snake that hang out in our um, deer grass. And one thing about the deer grass at our house is we need to prune it back because it does get a lot of uh, dead stuff in it. And for fire safety, we like to keep that out of there to the extent that it's possible. Wait, wait, yeah, if, if you did not cut it back, uh, ultimately this year's growth will be dead next year. Right. So if, if you don't remove that growth, you are gonna have um, more fire friendly vegetation. Yeah, okay. And then, um, one of the same persons wants to know, do you have any information on Pride of Madeira? The bees seem to love it. <laughs> and bees do love it. Um, and you see lots of bees on it, particularly European honeybees, because it's from Madeira in Europe. So they grew up together. You know, they've lived together for thousands of years. Um, so so, you know, Ashium, that's the, the genus that Pride of Madeira is in, uh, would have some limited usefulness as a pollinator supporter, but the rest of the vegetation is really not doing anything for uh, um, insect populations. Okay. Um... Can you talk about cultivars versus straight species of natives? And, and, and there is, and I think, uh, quite frankly, uh, I think as the years go on, we'll see more research in those areas to see um, how effective some of those cultivars and hybrids are at habitat support, pollinator support, versus the true species. And so I would suggest that if, if all else fails, stick to the straight species if you really want to be focused on, on creating habitat space. Um, but there certainly are, um, uh, there, there is even a word actually, congeners. C-O-N-G-E-N-E-R-S. 
means plants of the same genus. And so the question is, um, if, you, if you plant um, an Eastern redbud tree, which is a different species than the Western redbud tree, but if you plant the Eastern one here in Sonoma County, how much benefit would you get? Will the leaf cutter bees go to the Eastern dogwood to make nests? I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's just because we haven't answered those questions. It's, it's a concept that wasn't on the radar of um, gardeners and horticulture peoples until the last you know, decade or so. Um, we have a couple that are related to planting and fire threat. Do you feel comfortable talking about those? So um, are there pollen to, 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 the, to, to the best of my master gardener fire knowledge, um, you know, there's nothing that you can plant that's going to be fireproof. Um, there are some things that could be more fire resistant um, and clearly um, not letting the vegetation get, you know, brittle dry is one of the most important things. Um, you know, they even talk about that. You know, there was a, there's a, there's a, there was a lot of talk about coyote brush, um, Bacchus, and about its fire potential. And uh, but one of the things that they've discovered is that you know the Bacchus in its natural setting on a hillside, you know, in Eastern Sonoma County has a whole different fire profile than one planted in your garden that gets some drip irrigation. And so I, I think that we don't really know specifically, um, you know, how much that alters. Bill, uh, can your, this is Cleo. Um, I, I put the link to our coalition that we have between us, Habitat Corridor Project and the Ecology Center on specifically habitat gardening, native gardening, and firewise. And we have a number of uh, webinars that we did on the topic, and we have also content there with the recommendations on native gardening and firewise landscaping. Thank you, Cleo. Sorry <laughs> for <laughs> Fantastic, Cleo. That'll give a lot more information than, than Bill would be able to give in just just a, a short answer. Also. Absolutely. I, you know, uh, fire readiness was not part of my uh, 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 prep for this uh, presentation. Um, okay, let's see if we did that one. Um, I would like to put a native garden in part of a yard near the neighbor's pasture. It has never had animals or anything planted. I had the soil tested. It has great nutrients but needs nitrogen added. What's the best way to prepare the soil? Sounds like I would not want to sheet mulch. Okay. Um, and did the, did the premise of that question specifically address wanting to put native plants in, correct? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, one of the things to consider um, with native plantings is that um, uh, many native plants will do more poorly if you over amend the soil, if you add too much compost. You know, you're not growing vegetables, you're growing native plants, which require less nutrition. Um, and, um, if, and, if, and if that soil that she has, that area, um, said that it was low in nitrogen, you could just simply plant a couple of nitrogen fixers. You could put um, the, 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 the silver lupin bush, um, mm -hmm. lupinus albifrons. You could put some of those in there because that fixes nitrogen in the ground. Yeah, I think one thing that we wanna be aware of is that we don't want our natives growing really fast. It can actually um, shorten their lifespan. 
exactly. Yeah. You know, and nitrogen creates, you know, green growth. And, um, and one of the things with, with, and I talked about that is that uh, many of our natives do grow slowly. I mean, they just do. Right. So may, maybe, yeah, just plant some lupin and, and don't worry about the nitrogen content for the natives. Okay. Uh, Mason bees seem to love my blooming artichokes. Is this a native plant? Artichokes? No. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but, you know, artichoke flowers are loved by bees of all sorts. Um, you know, if, if you've ever peered into one of those uh, artichoke blooms when it's open, there's all kinds of critters that you find burrowed down in that purple bloom. Um, and so I, I don't find it surprising that um, any sort of, all sorts of pollinators would be attracted to uh, uh, um, that artichoke. Um, I, I, have a, I have a description for bees <laughs> that is not suitable for public um, because bees will go any place that there's pollen and nectar. It doesn't make, they, they really don't particularly care which plant it is with some very few exceptions. Um, it is the other creatures in your habitat space that are plant specific more than bees. Bees, but bees, uh, you know, pollinators are sort of the carriers. You have to have the pollinators, you have to have plants reproduce, you know, uh, they're sort of the vector for the habitat space to grow. Um, but bees are much less fussy about which plants are there than the other um, residents in your habitat space. Great. I, I know I have parsley growing all over and um, the native bees love it, but I'm sure it's not a native plant. Yeah, pretty much anything that we grow for food most anything that we grow for food comes from Europe. I mean, that, you know, I mean, we are a European civilization. And so that's where, you know, we didn't take our clues um, for food preparation from the native peoples who lived here before us. We, right. you know, we took those food cues from um, the European immigrants. Yeah. Great. And there's a comment. It says, I want to thank you, our speaker, for such a wonderful program. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate the positive feedback. Yeah. And that's the last question, unless somebody's going to type one in right now. Cool. And it's 12.05, so I guess we're supposed to be done. Yeah. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, so you'll have oh, to stop sharing. I have to stop share. I'm sorry. Thank okay. you. That's not a problem. Now I have to find the share screen. Okay. Share screen. It didn't move. Did it work? Yeah, we have you. We have your slideshow up. Okay. So questions and answers. And um, thanks a ton, Bill, for this wonderful talk. Um, and this presentation will be posted on our YouTube channel probably within the next week. We will be sending the um, everybody who attended will send you a link to that. And um, that way you can go back and check out these amazing, amazing photos and see what you might want to add to your yard at a little bit more leisurely pace. So did you have a comment, Bill? No, I was, I was just chuckling at, you know, as I rifle through those slides, it is, it's, it's hard for people to like get a grasp. It's a, it's a good, it's good that they have an opportunity to go back and, and look at things more carefully. Definitely. Yeah. And then I'd like to let you know about some upcoming talks. Um, next Tuesday, our food gardening specialists are going to be holding the veggie happenings session at 1230. Uh, you do need to register for that and you can um,
find the link on our website. Um, this next one is going to be about mulch in your food garden and is specifically related to mulch and fire. So for those of you who were interested in the fire aspects uh, or fire resistance aspects, you might want to tune in for that. And then we're also going to be talking about um, planning your fall food garden. Um, and then on October 9th, Bill's going to be back with us and he's going to talk about native trees of the North Bay. So that should be really interesting too. So there are a lot of links provided for you in the chat. And then um, also you might want to find the Talamy books at the Sonoma Library. So um, anyway, we hope this inspires you to take some actions and get more native plants in your yard and provide a lot more habitat for our native insects, birds, and on up the food chain. Thanks a lot, Bill. Okay, I'll be back in October. See you then. <laughs> Bill, there was a comment from a master gardener in Fresno thanking us. Oh, well, good. It's nice to see that we are attracting uh, stuff from elsewhere. Although I certainly was not addressing native plants in uh, Fresno <laughs> today. Do we want to end the meeting then, end the conference?